So, as you can see from this animated loop, my discussion is about the evolution of humans and how we're being affected by technology. And actually, if you look at this loop, that very last animation there with the guy, the really bloated guy with the headpiece on, that's actually a reference to some new VR technologies coming up this year, Oculus Rift, which was a company recently acquired by Facebook. And essentially, you put on this little head-mounted unit, and you can like see this virtual reality world 360. I tried it myself, and it's pretty amazing. It's going to be a game changer in the gaming industry. And also, uh, Sony's coming out with similar technology as well. So you can see in the future, we're all going to be just sitting there, uh, not moving, <laughs> eating through like IV tubes, and uh, you know, like the Matrix, pretty much. So the topic is the infobesity epidemic, and why attention spans are shrinking. So before I get into it, just a bit of a brief background. Um, I've been involved with technology since the 80s. I started off working at a company called SoftKey Software in the 80s. The uh, CEO was a gentleman named Kevin O'Leary. He's a pretty famous TV guy in Canada on CBC television. He's a famous uh, shark as well in the United States. And so through him, I learned a bit about how to be an entrepreneur and how to do, develop software. And then in the 90s, I worked in New York at uh, HBO and a couple other places. And I had the pleasure of working with filmmaker Spike Lee, who's one of my clients, and also uh, P. Diddy, who was known as uh, Puff Daddy back then. And then I ended up going to HBO, and, and I served as the uh, VP of content in uh, the di digital division there. And we had an urban outfit that we created called volume.com. And then from there, I went back to Canada and developed a cross-platform TV series called Zed. And this was on CBC Television in Canada. And it was kind of a groundbreaking series because we were able to take user-generated content, whether it was video or pictures or MP3s or music, and put it onto television. And uh, this is all pre-YouTube, so we're very much like a sort of a cutting-edge company. We got an Emmy nomination and a couple other things. And then, most recently, I joined the school of Moses Neimer at Zoomer Media. Moses Neimer is kind of like, I guess, like Marshall McLuhan, I guess, in some regards, a TV visionary who um, is known for creating shows that involve user-generated content, uh, creating new niches in television, like the MTV of Canada, Much Music. Um, so he's a, a true legendary visionary, and I'm fortunate enough to have him as boss. And I've had the privilege to work with people like Margaret Atworth, the author, where I got her on Twitter, and now she's like the queen of Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, and Conrad Black, who may not be known here in Barbados, but he is um, a well-known historian in Canada. Uh, as a polarizing figure in Canada. Some people hate him, some people love him. Uh, he's also a guy who allegedly fleeced a lot of shareholders of some money, so he spent some time in the U.S. jail, but he's also quite a brilliant, <laughs> minor detail, but, um, <laughs> but he's actually quite a brilliant guy who, uh, yeah, definitely is a lightning rod in Canada. Okay. There's nothing behind that, I just wanted to load that video. <laughs> absolutely no reason for that to be there. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with this quote that you can all read, and it's interesting because it talks about the uh, growing uh, flux of content, documentation, scientific journals. Uh, you can see that the issue in this quote here is concerned that there's just so much information being created since the 1800s. And so it would seem like there was a quote coming out in the last couple of years, but this quote from uh, James G. Miller actually is well before the information glut that we're looking at now. This came out in 1962. But it doesn't quite compare to what we're facing with now. Now we're dealing with the world of big data. So according to the Forum of Innovation, 90% of the world's existing data has been created in the last two years. So what does that mean? That means that basically the web alone is the equivalent of four zettabytes of data, which is equal to four billion terabytes or four trillion gigabytes. Or in biblical terms, that would be four towers of Babel. And uh, so as you can see from the chart, big data is everything. It's um, things that go into the cloud. It is your email. It's mobile content. As we become more and more digital with our phone services, with um, television like Netflix, all this stuff is digital information that is just compiling and compiling. And for those of you who have been following Edward Snowden, you know that all this uh, content is also accessible around the world by the likes of the NSA. So we're creating this massive amount of data uh, as we become more digital. So the problem with this amount of data is that it creates a bottleneck 
because we can only take in so much of this. And, and the reason why there's so much data being created is because digital products cost really nothing to make. So as a result, intangibles like uh, immediacy, personalization, accessibility, findability become more important in order to get people's attention spans. So this is kind of like a <laughs> symbolized what it's like for consumers these days. And again, it's very difficult for all of us to absorb this growth of, uh, of data, of information services, the whole nine yards. So it's having an impact on human beings. It's interesting because since 1998, our average attention span was about 12 minutes. So yeah, so 1998, we had 12 minutes of average attention span. 10 years later, it dropped down to five minutes, 2008. And then some studies showed that by 2000, it dropped down even further, dropped uh, down to 12 seconds. And over the next 13 years, it dropped even further, as you can see there, dropped 33% since 2000. This is a study by Lloyd's, Lloyd's uh, TSB Insurance in the UK. And apparently this uh, loss of attention is costing the British economy 1.6 pounds annually. So now our attention span is literally eight seconds. That's the average human attention span. So, the tech writer Nicholas Carr, author, believes that the web actually causes brain damage. And um, he, he did a study of information on uh, gaming addicts in China, where there's like a, a percentage of, of gaming users who are very hardcore. And they did some, uh, some scans of their brain and actually showed that the brain had actually changed because of the overuse of the internet and gaming and things like that. So there are signs that, you know, that the brain is affected by information blood and by gaming and all those sort of things. So to quote T.S. Eliot, we're distracted from distraction by distraction. And here is Homer demonstrating absolutely nothing. <laughs> so here's another number to note. Nine seconds. Nine seconds is the average attention span of a goldfish. So we're actually worse than a goldfish. You know, but of course, the goldfish, you know, they have their reasons for having a good attention span. So, and here is a chart just showing our attention span compared to the goldfish. So, of course, the goldfish is steady, hasn't changed in quite a while. <laughs> Ours is depleting. <laughs> so, cause for concern. Okay, another number to note 174. 174 is the number, the equivalent of newspapers that we're exposed to in terms of data on a daily basis. This is a, based on a study from the University of Southern California. So this is five times more information daily that we received in 1986. And uh, the average person produces six newspapers worth of information compared to just two and a half pages 24 years ago. So that's a 200% uh, increase. Okay, here's another compelling number, the number 30. So 30 is the number of times that office workers check their email inbox, and that's per hour. Oh my so, God, that's not true. It is true. <laughs> <Very> true. <laughs> no way. By the way, if anyone's checking their phones right now, feel free to do so. <laughs> Part of the study here. Okay, another number, 21. This number is the number of times that grids switch between gadgets. And again, this is per hour. So as you see, you know, we are becoming increasingly distracted by the sheer amount of data that we're dealing with. Um, similar research from OMD showed that you know, months after um, they tested people using devices, it showed that the amount of distraction increased 500% in three years as well. So there's a lot of evidence showing that we are using a lot of devices, multitasking, not necessarily uh, retaining the information. Now, in terms of how we actually perceive the web, it's interesting because the percent of page views, <laughs> that's how people read the web, by the way. So the percent of page views that last less than four seconds is 17%. The percent of page views that lasted more than 10 minutes is 4%. The percentage of words that are read on web pages with 111 words or less is 49%. And the percentage of words read on average web pages, the number of words, 593 is the average, is 28%. So clearly people are not reading entire web pages. And there's, it's very interesting because people in my business, we all know that, we kind of encourage that, and I'll explain the business model behind that in a second. But it's all about speed. So Facebook, for instance, is showing, their research shows that updates on their platform are getting shorter, like Twitter as well. People want faster communication, which is one reason why Instagram is popular. Images are just faster than typing. So as a result, you're seeing the increase of, of uh, photo sharing sites like Vine, which actually is for video as well as, uh, as um, images. Instagram, Snapchat. If you look at the younger demographic, 
the millennials, they're not really reading. They've never been big users of email. They text, and now they're not even texting. Now they're sharing images. So all, all this is a response to the fact that you know we're having a hard time actually consuming all the information. For those of you who are over 50, good news. People over 50 are the last remaining generation who actually have the ability to concentrate. It's actually a fact. So, <laughs> <long ago. laughs> <Long ago. laughs> So this is a famous animated GIF. An animated GIF is a file, video file format that came out in the 90s uh, when I first started the web business. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see that with this video, it's very short, but it tells a story. It's a compelling sports story. So animated GIFs have soared in popularity in the last couple of years. Um, and this is a response to the fact that people are watching shorted videos. According to Comscore, which is a company that measures web traffic, the average length of online video watched by Americans has decreased over the last year by seven minutes to just over five minutes. So again, we're watching shorter content, consuming faster, simply because we have to. Um, just an interesting little tidbit. This is actually an animated gift from 150 years ago. In the 19th century, artists relied on optical tools like the zoetropes and some other tools that I can't even pronounce. And so these are actually little animated boards that when you spin them, they actually look like cartoons. So the idea of an animated GIF is actually not that new. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, there is a surge in mobile messaging as a response to not reading emails and to responding to information much faster. So we're seeing now companies like WeChat, they're a mobile company based in China. They've got uh, 300 million members. There's Google Hangouts, there's another 300 million. Um, Kick, which is a company based in uh, Waterloo in uh, Canada, and they've got 100 million members. Then there's uh, Facebook Messenger. Facebook has a user base of 1.1 billion. Many of them are now mobile users. So as a result, their mobile messaging platform is 945 million. Uh, Lines, a Japanese company, similar functionality, 270 million. WhatsApp, which is recently purchased by Facebook for $19 billion. I think their staff has about 35 people. So that valuation has made it very clear, made it very clear that this is the hot area right now. Um, in fact, the company Kick, the Canadian company, they have about 20 employees there. And based on the valuation of WhatsApp, they're probably going to be worth about $2 billion for their exit. So again, it's going to be a company of 20 people being purchased for about $2 billion. So that's a company to watch. Also, there's um, Instagram, which is actually not just a photo sharing platform, but also instant messaging as well. People are sharing information between each other. And then there's a Canadian company, BlackBerry, who have uh, seen their fortunes fall quite a bit in the last uh, five years or so. But their user base for BlackBerry Messenger is still pretty big, 200 million. So they actually would be a company that's worth a lot more divided as opposed to one company. The total number just based on, on these messaging platforms, is 2.6 billion. So as you can see, the world is becoming more and more short form. This is bypassing traditional uh, SMS text messaging. You can do things like sharing video images. And this is really the big growth area that everyone's watching because mobile is the big growth area. So now the response in my business is basically to get you to move faster. That's all we want. We don't want you to just move faster, read stuff, don't even read, share as much as you possibly can. We actually don't even care if people read articles. We have a term for it called TLDR, too long, didn't read. And so everything we do is designed to be clicked, consumed, shared. Our business model is driven by clicks, not by the number of people who actually read the entire article or watch the entire video. We just want you guys to click. So we are rewarded for creating content that goes viral. There's a whole bunch of businesses now that are in the business of viral content. BuzzFeed is one of the most popular, and I'll describe them more in a second. Upworthy is another one. Business Insider, it's all about being faster. So the way that we determined all this is by looking at the data that is created whenever you visit a website or use any of our digital products. So the idea of anonymity on the internet is actually completely false. We know what you want, we know what you're trying to do, we know how long you're looking at pages, we know why. And there's a lot of uh, ways that we're doing that. Here's a very simple breakdown of a tool called Google Analytics. This is basically the gold standard in terms of analyzing what the users are doing on our websites. So this chart, you can see that we can look at the daily visits, we can see uh, where they're coming from, whether it's from other websites or whether it's organic through Google or whether it's through a direct link as well. We can see the country. We can see how they're getting there based on keywords. If you're typing in 
uh, Barbados, football, we'll know exactly how you got to our sites based on those keywords. And Google actually is doing a very interesting thing. They're starting to encrypt their keyword search because it makes it more difficult for marketers like us to be able to determine who's coming to our site based on what words. And they're doing that not for security purposes, they're doing that because they want to spend money on advertising. But they claim it's for security. Uh, we can also see the audience numbers, as you can see there, the visits, how many pages you look at per visit. Uh, that's a very important number because even if you have just 6,000 visits like this chart, if they're all looking at three or four pages each, then that's the numbers of ads that are loading up. So that ad impression inventory increases the more pages you look at. Uh, we can also look at things like loyalty too, which is not on this um, graphic, but loyalty shows you know, how often people come to the site and how long they're spending on the site and how frequent they come to the site. Okay, I think there's another chart here. Yeah, this shows the number of visits in the last 30 days. And the page views, as I mentioned earlier, are very important. The pages per visit, 7.2 there, is a very important number because essentially, if we have three ads per page, then that ad inventory would be the 22,000 times uh, three times the seven number of visits per visit, or pages per visit. And here's another chart that shows the sections of a website in terms of uh, which are the most popular. It's another important thing because we look at this and we try to figure out which sections should we invest in. And by the way, if any of this is getting too geeky or too nerdy, let me know because this presentation was originally designed for uh, a bunch of media professors and uh, some deans at uh, universities in Ontario. So it's a little bit geeky, so let me know if it's getting too geeky. And if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt. It's a very interactive conversation. Okay, so the I'm going to talk about business models now for a second. So the first business model in terms of digital, in terms of getting your attention span, was spam. And I'm showing this computer for a reason. This computer was actually the first spam that went out in history. This was sent in 1978 through, through a network called ARPANET, which is the predecessor of the internet. And it was a message that was advertising this new DEC computer. And it was sent to 393 people who freaked out when they got it, the very first spam, they were very angry. But they had no idea that this was the beginning of a massive fire hose of, of uh, spam that we're all dealing with right now. The reason why spam is so uh, prevalent is because it costs next to nothing to send spam. So even if you get a conversion of one out of 100,000 items that you've spammed, that's actually quite profitable for the guys who are selling, even though it's like 0.001%. So that means that there's a likelihood of like a purchase within one to 25,000 uh, spammed items. And what this has done is that it's shift the cost of distribution and spamming and all that kind of stuff to the ISPs, because now they gotta pay for it as opposed to the guys who are selling it. And the other cost is us consumers, because we're now being charged in the form of attention. We've got to look through the stuff in our inboxes and sift out what's real versus what's spam. There's all kinds of spam. There's not just email spam like this item here, but there's comment spam. If you go to certain websites, you'll notice in the comment areas there's like people selling products. Those are robots that are selling products, not necessarily human beings. There's instant messaging spam that you can get in uh, applications like even um, WeChat. There's social spam on dating sites. There's a lot of accounts on dating sites that are actually fake, that are bots. And spam is estimated to be a $200 million a year business. That was a couple years ago, 2012. But the cost to society is actually $20 billion. So it's a losing proposition for us, but for a handful of marketers, spam is very lucrative. The other business model in terms of uh, the internet that has emerged, obviously, are display banner ads. You've seen them all on your websites. Banner ads are actually starting to really become a, a lost cause for a lot of marketing companies like where I work because the click-through rate on these banner ads has dropped 98% in the last 10 years. Uh, despite the formats, as you can see, this, we've tried everything. We've tried leaderboards, we've tried big boxes, you know, we've tried everything, and, and people are just not clicking on them. So you'll see this format start to disappear in the next um, five years or so. And here's a chart, <laughs> here's a chart showing the click-through rate. So as I mentioned, it's declined 98% in the last 10 years. Um, the, the click-through rate is so small that it is only meaningful if you have major scale like Google or with Facebook. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this business model is that advertisers are now starting to remember or starting to realize that 61% of all traffic aren't even human beings, they're bots, botnets. So the, uh, the 61% are botnets. So the Washington Post did a piece uh, two weekends ago 
about how advertisers now are starting to realize that over 30% of the clicks on their ads on the internet are not human beings, they're just bots. So even at our company, I'm, I'm in charge of uh, coming up with our traffic generation strategy. And there's a company in New Jersey that we would buy traffic from for a very cheap price. Normally you pay something like a dollar per click if you go through Google. This company in New Jersey was, was doing it for like half a penny per click. And so we'd verify and make sure that it wasn't junk traffic or anything like that. But the reality is when you get a click for that cheap, without question, some of it is not human beings. In fact, there's a good chance that there's a server farm somewhere in Thailand being populated with chimpanzees hitting touch screens. <laughs> I wouldn't rule it out. <laughs> Okay, so web design. So this is another response to the shrinking attention span that we are dealing with on the digital marketing side. Uh, this is a web page that Homer Simpson designed a long time ago. This is what all web, web pages were like back in the 90s. They were all pretty much designed like that. Um, so with web design, usability is everything. Essentially, the user experience is what we focus on uh, considerably. And what we try to develop are things that we call persuasion triggers. These are items that get you to click on things. We try to make it easier to share the content. We do lots of A-B multivariate testing. And what that is is that you can go to an article, you see a certain headline, and if you reload the page, it'll be a different headline. And so what we're doing is testing multiple headlines to see which one gets the most clicks. The one that gets the most click ends up being the default headline for the story for the rest of the day. Now the challenge for us on the design side is that in order to maintain an optimal processing speed, the human brain filters about 99% of the sensory information that it consumes immediately after it's actually consumed it, so it's forgotten. So what we do now on, on the web front is to design things that are memorable, that are shocking, that will stand out, things that are, are unusual to attract your attention span. So here's an example of how web pages are designed. The top example is how you think people will read web pages, but we don't actually read left or right like newspapers. It's scattered all over the page. So as a result, some of the most compelling clicks are in areas that you wouldn't expect. This is a company called Basecamp. They're one of the top project management companies out there. And as you can see from their design, like they've got it down. They know which areas get your attention first. Generally, the top left is where a lot of design starts. But it isn't necessarily in the order of like left or right, as you can see. And again, the whole intention is to make it really simple, to get people to click, and to have a few points of focus and uh, just to make sure things like uh, generate a lot of pages. So we have things like pagination, for instance. Colors also plays a big role. Certain colors get users to click more than other colors. Yeah, it's all analyzed based on the numbers that we can see from the traffic from, from human beings. So here's some examples of colors that actually work when it comes to web pages. Again, it's all these little details that go into navigation that encourage you to explore the website. Okay, the next thing in terms of monetizing the attention span is click-worthy content. So apart from design, apart from banner ads, the other part of the business model for us is to make to have content that you will click on and share with your friends. So as I mentioned earlier, buzzfeed.com is the pioneer in this space. What they do is create media for board office workers. And they're the pioneers of what's called listicles. So a listicle is like top 27 cats who look like humans, like that kind of thing. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of that. From their strategy, they say that headlines need to generate curiosity. So they can't be too vague, they can't be too specific. You don't want to give away too much information. They have this uh, funny saying at BuzzFeed, business up front, party in the back. So the business up front is the article. The comment engines, are the, that's where the party is. So they're constantly tweaking and optimizing their website. They're removing stories in real time. They're responding to the traffic during the day. And there's a very interesting quote from BuzzFeed. They say that couch potatoes don't matter on the web, crazy people do. And it's true. <laughs> the internet is dominated by freaks like Perez Hilton, yeah. uh, Apple fanboys, yeah. uh, blog commenters, anim animal freaks, especially cats. And um, so 75% of their readers come specifically to share content. So their model is working very well. Okay, as I mentioned, 75% there. And it's interesting because their business model is evolving considerably compared to the days of display banner ads. What they're doing is essentially what's called native advertising. So they're blurring the lines between content and with advertising. And we're getting to that business as well at our company. Advertorials, sponsored pages, 
Um, they're not big believers in banner ads, as you can see. Um, and they're creating ads that are shared, essentially editorial that ends up being shared, but it's essentially uh, an advertorial. And here's a typical BuzzFeed type story. Cats do very well online. I heard an estimate that um, something like 15% of web traffic is cat related. So this article, as you can see, there's a Virgin Mobile in the corner. So this is actually an advertorial, even though it's done in the BuzzFeed style. And this article was shared more than 18,000 times on Facebook and got over 600,000 views on social media. And 30% of that traffic came from shares. The industry itself, potential is huge. Uh, branded entertainment, native advertising, is worth $44 billion in the U.S. and it's growing. Another uh, example is Upworthy.com. These guys are doing very well. Uh, I actually took this from their own slideshow. Uh, so what they do is they basically just curate content. They frame it for Facebook by writing great headlines, put it on their Facebook channels, and they promote it on Facebook by buying the traffic. And the difference between what they sell versus what they pay in Facebook is enough to generate a profit. Although recently, Facebook changed their algorithm, which killed a lot of their traffic, which was very damaging for this company. And as, it, as we, uh, you see here in the slide, they are off to a great start compared to some other sites. Um, Upworthy had some explosive growth in the last year. And they explain here how they actually get their clicks. <laughs> so yeah, it's not about being an expert. Okay, so this is what they have instead. <laughs> That's how you get traffic. <laughs> and what these guys do wow. is that they write 25 headlines for every piece of content. In the game, they, they track which one is doing well, and they automatically use that for the default halfway through the day. Uh, here's a funny slide from the same company. This slide explains it all. So as you can see, the difference in the headlines, you know, the first one is just too clever, doesn't leave a lot to the imagination. The second one's very straightforward. And it's a huge difference in terms of the implications of going viral. Okay, one more example. Distractify.com, doing the same thing as BuzzFeed. They have these listicles. They're doing very well with traffic, exact same model. And they're also doing um, native slash branded advertising as well. And as, as you can tell from their domain name, they make no, no bones about it. They are there to distract you while you're working. Okay, now in terms of your attention span, we just looked at some display ads, we looked at things that human beings are doing online. But there are things that, that we're doing that actually is being captured as well, which we may not be aware of. And the leader in that space is Google. And uh, Google is a very interesting company because their motto is do no evil. I don't trust any company or anyone who says that. So that's a huge flag right there. And, and they're dominating in a lot of ways that people may not realize. And I'll give you some examples. Let me get this slide to move forward next. Oh, oops, I think it just crashed. Okay, so Leonard, will be another song? <laughs> How do we start the application? It just crashed. Yeah, hold on. That's weird. That's how powerful Google is, by the way. Yeah, so funny. Didn't have it on Facebook. Okay, let me just get rid of this. Oops. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just kidding. Okay, so hopefully Google will not shut me down. So Google, um, they're expanding the definition of attention to include things that are non-visual data. So most people think of attention as things you're looking at, but Google actually captures things that you're doing. So for example, there's Android. Android is the operating system that runs their tablets, that runs their smartphones. Android is now the, the biggest mobile operating system. They've, they've passed Apple a long time ago. They have 900 million users. Google Maps has 58 million users as well. Google Drive, which is their cloud services, it has their spreadsheets and word processing, has 120 million users. Their browser, which was basically launched about three years ago, has gone from like being number five to like number one now. It's the most popular browser. 
And of course, their email services, Gmail, hugely popular, just turned six recently. And YouTube gets one billion unique visitors a month. And the thing with YouTube is that they bought YouTube for 1.65 billion uh, not that long ago. So that was, was a huge deal. One of the things that most people don't know about is uh, Google Chromebooks. These are like cloud-based laptops that are inexpensive and they've sold about uh, half a million last year. They're now 10% of the, of the marketplace. Um, one thing to mention too is that Google, when it comes to all these services, they tend to actually capture what's called your DNS. So if you have an Android device, if you look at your settings, you'll see the DNS is Google's numbers, 8.8.8.8. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that with DNS, uh, it converts uh, IP addresses to website domains. So and what it means is that Google can actually see what you're doing without you going to Google. You can actually just use their browser, use their device, and they know what you're doing on the internet, which is very interesting. So it's a way of capturing passive attention. They're also gathering content through what they call APIs. APIs allows you to use Google with your own application. So if you have a website, say the best hotels in Barbados, you can use Google's API to show those hotels using Google's maps. So again, it's another way of capturing content through their services, largely through a programming script language called Ajax or JavaScript. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's Google DNS. It's a public DNS service. They encourage people to use it because in theory it's faster than your own ISP's DNS. So that's the upside. And here's how it works. Basically, you can type in a domain name and it converts it to the IP address and then it gets you to the domain. But again, as I mentioned earlier, this captures a lot of information about what you're doing online, what you're, what you're uh, searching for. It captures your IP address, your location, the web history, a lot of stuff. Google says that this information is not tied into your Google account and their privacy statement, but you know, they say it won't be shared. It doesn't mean that they won't actually use it themselves. So again, Google, please don't be evil. Now, this is what Google's doing in your home, in your living room. So Google has this new gigabit fiber connection that they're offering in a handful of cities, but they're hoping to spread it out throughout uh, the United States. Started off in Kansas, and what it means for consumers is that you'll get internet access that's like 10 to 100 times faster than what you currently have. So it's expanding, uh, started in Kansas, and now it's reaching out to, I think, another half dozen cities. They also have um, this thing called Project Loom, and it's basically these balloons that go around the world and they offer internet access. Facebook's also doing the same thing as well. And so the, the whole intent there is to offer internet access to countries that don't have um, you know, complete bandwidth. Then there's Google's self-driving cars, an experiment that they started uh, about a year ago or two years ago. And so again, the, the upside is like you get people you know, around without having to have a driver, which could probably decimate the taxi industry in like the next 10 years. But the real upside for Google is that they actually capture your location and where you're going to. It's just more data that they can use to sell things to you. And then there's uh, the Internet of Things. Some of you may have heard of Nest. Nest is a hardware device, a thermometer, a smart thermometer that you install in your home and it learns your, your uh, comfort zones and adjusts the temperature based on your taste. And it's all plugged into the Internet. So this company was bought by Google. Yeah, this whole Internet of Things is going to be huge. It's going to be a $44 billion industry in the next three years. Uh, this company was acquired by Google for $3.2 billion. And at some point, the Internet of Things will mean that you'll have your refrigerator talking to your, your stove, talking to your smartphones, saying you're running low on these ingredients. Like, there are literally companies like LG who are working on this technology. It was actually um, demoed at CES this year in Las Vegas. So watch for that term, the Internet of Things, because it's going to be huge. And then there's the Google Glass, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Wearable technology. You put on the glasses and you get to see things that others can't see, like a head-up display. Data about the person that you're talking to. Get all their information as you're speaking to them. Make sure you know their name properly. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of privacy issues with this because these glasses have the ability to record as well. So there are a couple places in the U.S. that have actually banned Google Glasses. Um, it's going to probably completely revolutionize the porn industry. Um, and then there's this strange thing that Google announced this year, Google Contacts. So they say that this is a tool for, for measuring and helping you manage diabetes because a lot of diabetes you know, is, um, occurs in your eyes, right? So this is a, they're selling it as a health 
item. It's actually not for sale yet, but they're doing a lot of research in this area. They just announced it this year. Who knows what they're really planning to do with this. Now here's something interesting. You see that thing there? So that's called a big dog. That's by a company called Boston Dynamics. And they were financed by DARPA, which is the research arm of uh, the US military. This company has developed about eight, eight or uh, nine of these uh, devices that essentially can hunt you down. <laughs> they, this, will, this thing does not really fall, as you can see. It can go through any kind of terrain. It can climb uphill. If you knock it down, it gets up. It can go on ice as well. And Boston Dynamics has other models. Like there's one called, uh, I think it's called Leopard, and it runs 30 miles an hour. There's another one that they just launched that runs 18 miles an hour that's untethered. So the reason why I'm showing this is because Google has bought this company and they bought seven other companies in this space of robotics. No one knows what they're planning to do with this stuff. Very peculiar, you know. They haven't actually talked about what they're planning to do with it, but very fascinating that Google's quietly accumulating these robotic companies. Okay, so more transhumanism. Well, we've come a long way <laughs> beyond those days. So, solutions to infobesity. So the fact that we're, again, getting our attention span shrunken, we have these companies at Google who are just uh, bombarding us with data, there are some other companies who see a business opportunity there who are actually launching or rolled out software products that help us manage our attention span better. Okay, I just want to see if everyone's paying attention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, here's an application called Track Time. It's a Mac OS X application. So you've heard of this? Yeah. So you use it to track your time. It tells you, uh, you know, how you're spending your time with multiple projects as well. Um, it actually monitors your iTunes listening. So if you spend, you know, three hours a day listening to iTunes, your web browsing uh, habits as well. So it's just another example of how at least one company is trying to to monetize the fact that our attention span is shrinking. Here's another example. This is another Mac application. And this one allows you to just create an activity, whether it's design, study, write, and then you create these actions that you run every time you do the activity. And when you're ready to do the activity, you click concentrate, and all your actions will run, and there's a timer that tells you, okay, you spent 45 minutes on this particular task. <laughs> There's another one as well. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, this one is a timer as well. It's a very simple timer. You just set your time, what you want to do, and it lets you know when the time's expired. So it's another way of um, having some kind of focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what we need as human beings. <laughs> And then there's also the web response as well. There's websites like Long Reads. They actually will show you roughly how long it will take to read a piece for those who have no patience. <laughs> so it's no longer just word count. It's how much time it's going to take. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, very long. Yeah. And just so you know, this this um, you know this whole thing of trying to get people to be more focused is not a new thing in terms of the business opportunity. It actually uh, started in 1925 with this particular product called the Isolator. And there it is. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not the first time we've tried this. I want one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, I want one. We need a new version of one of these. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What is that? Oxygen, man. Oh. No, that's yeah. not good. Oh, that's it's probably oh, watching gas. So, for those of you who are teachers in the crowd, this next session is about the children. So, there are some warning signs. In 2012, the Pew Internet Project did a survey of 2,500 middle and high school students. And the survey showed that, you know, a large number of them are having a hard time being able to find credible sources. Yeah, and uh, here's the other thing. 83% of them uh, would agree that the information available is overwhelming for students. Notice they're not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were in. 
they are bursting. Yeah. They are bursting here. So the other challenge for academia is that kids are showing up with multiple devices. In fact, you can see from this chart here that the average uh, number of devices per student is 6.9 devices. So that's laptops, smartphones, and everything. So that's a challenge when you're teaching someone who not only has access to the world's information, but also has split focus, uh, a shortened attention span. That's the US though, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the US stats. Uh, then the other challenge too is wearable cloud-based technology. So students showing up with technology that they can wear, you know, they can do an exam and have access to every answer off their wristwatch. Um, here's a funny version of wearable technology. This isn't actually real. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned earlier, there's Google Glass as well, which I haven't heard of this being banned from any schools. As a matter of fact, there's a school in the States that actually is encouraging it as an education tool. So it actually may be of value. And of course, all of this is leading us towards the singularity Ray Kurzweil. At some point, we're going to merge with computers. Computers are getting smarter, and we're getting more computer-like. So it's just a matter of time. OK. Now, for schools, for academia, the value proposition is that you know, schools will become this sort of oasis for sustained focus, which is a very increasingly important thing. Um, even in our business world, we're looking for students who have the ability to do data analysis. And so that's one of the fastest growing areas in academia right now. There's a huge demand for it, and it's a fast growing area in the business world as well. And so I know a couple of uh, students who are actually taking those courses, and already they're getting job opportunities. So I think it's a very good growth area. Also, the fact that um, colleges and universities are great incubators for R&D, for finding solutions. For instance, writing code that requires serious concentration. And my recommendation, for schools, um, which is the audience I was showing this to, um, is actually overlapping disciplines because I think that it's important now for uh, schools to not function as silos because the solutions to a lot of these problems are various disciplines from technology to marketing to content. And so that's one of the things that um, I've recommended to universities in, in Ottawa and Ontario is that they should actually collaborate, allow the students to actually work together regards of the discipline and, and do it the same way we do in the business world and actually find solutions that way. Another opportunity in terms of solving the problem is just giving up free Adderall. <laughs> <laughs> That'll work. So on that note, I will wrap this with another uh, little video. <laughs> there you go. Thank you for paying attention. Uh, anyone needs to reach me, here's my contact information. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Is everybody afraid of Google now? <laughs> okay. You're talking about a. It's an auction. You bid for a keyword. So if you want the word Barbados and you're competing against other guys with that word, you could pay up to, like, say, three bucks for that word to show up at the top of their results or on their, their uh, search engine results page. Now, there are other companies who are doing what's called sub-penny SEM. And so those companies are offering clicks, the same thing Google offers, for a fraction of the cost. So for instance, in uh, New Jersey, the company that we use is called Relevads. And they get their traffic from multiple sources. They're not very transparent in terms of where it's from. But they offer clicks for like half a penny, essentially. For traffic meaning somebody pressing a button? Yes. Not necessarily a human being. Right. Someone clicked. Somebody clicking. So what we do is we turn around and say to advertisers, your ad has been seen X thousand of times, and they don't normally ask us where the traffic's from. Eventually they will start doing that. But normally they ask for two things, how many impressions and what the click-through rate was. So if there was 100,000 impressions and the click-through rate is 2%, then they get 2,000 clicks. Actually less than 200 clicks. So it's, uh, it's an interesting business model that is in deep trouble right now because of the fact that everyone knows that these clicks may not necessarily be humans. Mm -hmm. And so the big winner in this will be Facebook because their clicks are actual human beings. Yeah. Yeah, so I heard that click farms in Asia are offsetting this whole Facebook advertising because they'll just go around and click on various fan pages to yeah. kind of trick Facebook. And then Facebook will turn around and it will affect the other uh, websites. I have a friend who has a 
I think a following of 60,000 fans on Facebook. And he, I think he closed the account because he made a post and only it only reached about 600 people. So, so been, many businesses, yeah. from what I hear, are really upset with that. Well, there's a whole sort of cottage industry of these companies who offer uh, Twitter followers, Facebook likes, as well as clicks, and they do it dirt cheap. You can also buy YouTube views as well. Wow. So, yeah, so again, there are people working in these sort of like digital sweatshops yeah. who are just clicking. And again, I think there's probably environments where there's a bunch of chimpanzees and touch screens. Wouldn't surprise me. So, do you think that's going to change the culture and change how, it's, how business is done in that respect? I, I think that Google will have to clamp down on it to some extent, and they say that they already do that. But Google benefits from this as well because they have their ads on all kinds of weird websites and they make money off that. So again, Facebook will be the big winner in this space. Uh, the big shift right now is towards mobile advertising and also video. Video is like the most valuable ad unit right now in the internet business. And that's partly because of the fact that there, those are real impressions and people we can actually measure if they watch the entire ad or not. Whereas a click is like, we see there's a click, we can't tell how much they've actually read on the page. And us as marketers, we don't really care if they read the page or not. It's the clicks that matter to us. <clears throat> Any more questions? Um, do you think that we should try to keep up with the development of this space? I mean, or we should just address it. Stay in our own uh, world and, 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 and refuse the development of this space. Well, I had a conversation with this guy named Don Tapscott, who's um, one of the uh, professors at the University of Toronto. He wrote the book Wiki, Wikinomics. And he's actually very optimistic because you know he works very closely with students, and he thinks that the younger generation have the ability to filter out a lot of noise. So he thinks that you know it doesn't matter how much information is out there, it's mainly for the good, and that it will benefit us as a, as a society, particularly in things like democracy, which I don't totally agree with. And he uses um, gaming as an example of sustained focus. So you have kids playing these games for like three, four hours straight. But to me, that's not the same thing as like real world uh, usage. Like you can play a game for three hours, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're paying attention to anything else. So even though he's a, you know, very much an optimist, I think that people will probably pay to actually have less bombardment. But the problem is that that won't happen because things like location-based advertising is just starting. Uh, if you've seen that movie Minority Report, you may remember a scene with Tom Cruise walking through a shopping mall and um, his retina is being read by devices and he's seeing ads, audio ads based on his personal data. That's not far-fetched. There's a lot of companies who are very interested in that sort of thing and are spending a lot of money on that. Uh, companies like Amazon, by the way, are also getting into robots. Like they, they, uh, Jeff Bezos said that they are going to be delivering product through drones, which some people thought it was a PR stuff, but if you look at what Amazon and what Facebook are doing and what Google's doing, I don't think it's far-fetched at all. So, yeah, I think it's good to block it out, but I don't think it's possible, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> or you can pay for it. It's There's a business scary, opportunity there. It's really scary. Yeah. Yeah, it's petrifying because it's, I mean, this is all, like, it's all superficial. Everything is being dumbed down. There's, like, little content that's being absorbed in it. I mean, we're certainly feeling the results of that in the classroom, I think. It's petrifying. Yeah, but the upside is that the costs are re relatively low. So a place like Barbados, <laughs> it's true. Like you can have uh, server farms or you can have um, the same thing that those other guys are doing with all the clicks. You could do that here in Barbados and it'd be a lot less expensive compared to other industries. So there's no reason why Barbados couldn't have like a huge role in the information economy because it's much cheaper than say oil and gas. But again, you're contributing to the overall issue of like lack of privacy and the shrinking attention span. But economically, it actually makes a lot of sense, especially a place like Barbados, where there's a lot of knowledge workers here, and also like a political stability, economic stability, relatively speaking. <laughs> yeah. Right. Compared to like, Compared other. To other yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Huh. So do you take your own privacy measures? Are you, are you paranoid when you <laughs> use? These not particularly. Out. What I do is I put a lot of smoke screens. So I use Twitter for garbage. I just throw a lot of stuff on Twitter that's completely useless, and to a lesser extent Facebook. 
So if a government was actually doing a scan of me, they wouldn't find anything of value. I don't really put my political views on the internet, um, especially anything that's anti-government, because the problem with data is that once you're flagged, it doesn't disappear. You know, once you're in a database, in the internet, anything you post online doesn't disappear. Someone else has it. And as Edward Snowden made very clear, you know, the NSA, they were capturing mountains of data from not just the United States, but also from Canada, everywhere, essentially. And it wasn't clear how long they kept the data, but it was very obvious that they were capturing this information. And they were doing it with the support of some of these internet companies, and also doing it without the support of some of those companies. They actually created a fake Facebook server, and Facebook was quite upset about that. And they, they, say, they say they're upset, I'm not sure they really were or not, but the fact is they were circumventing some of these companies and working very closely with them to capture all this content. And the bigger problem is that most of these companies are US based. So they're basically the beast of the belly, they're the belly of the beast. And again, there's another opportunity there because here in Barbados, you can set up a cloud service that doesn't cost anything and the emphasis is on security and privacy and basically serve the world. So maybe I should move here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> question um, over here. Um, all you got is saying that our attention span is getting shorter. So for instance, you know, I'm going to say if you're putting a video in there on, on, on the web, keep it short, to the point, a couple of seconds, and you get attention. So is this rule just for the internet or for, for real world practical practicality? Because you'll still find these same people going to Cinema or watching movie for hour and a half. Yeah, it's mostly for the internet because it's an interactive platform and it's also the most fragmented platform. So, for instance, if you have a tablet for reading a book, you know, someone who's selling the book is not just competing against other authors, they're competing against TV shows, they're competing against games, they're competing against websites. So, it's, it's mostly the interactive nature of the internet. Uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but I have noticed people walking in and out of the theater during a movie way more often than ever used to happen before. Teenagers with phones or whatever, you know, it's, it's walking in and out. The movie's not necessarily what's holding their attention all the time. It becomes a place to hang out, I suppose. Yeah. But I've been wondering, I've been wondering about that myself. But, but, but even when I was a teenager, that used to happen. Yes, indeed, right? agreed. Me too. But because when we were a teenager, you usually go to the theater just as a hangout spot. Right, right, right. But then for, maybe you get a certain age, you actually go to the theater for the movie. So yes, you have to go for, so. for the movie. Are they, are, are they still sitting down for the whole movie, or are they getting up on the movie as well? Yeah. yeah, but the flip side of that would be Netflix, which is an internet service. Right. So they, you know, because of the fact that they now launched entire series once, like House of Cards, so now you've seen the, the creation binge of watching. binge watching. Yeah, so people yeah. will watch the entire season in one weekend. Guilty. Yeah, so that's like the opposite. <laughs> so I think it depends. I mean, again, the internet is an interactive platform, but something like the web uh, is far more interactive than, say, Netflix. So Netflix right. is geared towards sitting there and consuming the content the entire weekend with a tablet in your bed, which I've done. And what is the impact? You said they were doing studies looking at the impact of uh, excessive hours of gaming on the brain. Yeah, so that's a very interesting study which I researched after I did this um, this presentation. It's for an article that I wrote in Toronto. And so uh, they were studying these Chinese gamers who were viewed at, defined as internet addicts because they're spending all their time just playing these games online. And so what they did was uh, some brain scans and they showed that it actually altered parts of their brain. So there wasn't any conclusion in terms of the impact in terms of whether they're comprehension have been reduced or not, but there's definitely evidence that it does change your brain to some extent. That's why Nicholas Carr, the, um, the writer, he says that he thinks the internet causes brain damage. But you'll never hear that from me. <laughs> I'm, really, I'm selling concepts. I sell ads. <laughs> okay, so uh, if there are no questions, then we'll have a closing performance from Leonard. And uh, so it's up to you to choose whatever song you want. Over to you. Thank you.